Okay, so I'm recording, but please don't let that stop you from answer, asking questions because uh, it's just for the people who are at the multiverse school and I can put it on the internet. So, welcome to the pre work day of using large language models. Um, what we're going to do today is install Python if you have not installed it, but I think everyone here has installed Python, so I'm going to skip it unless someone shows up who hasn't installed Python. Um, if you don't want to install Python, use Google Colab. You'll probably be using Google Colab for a lot of things anyway, so use Google Colab. It's super great. If you're going to run local language models, um, or if you're going to run open source language models, uh, you're going to want to learn to use Uba Booga with Google Colab. So uh, there's a link here. I'll go ahead and just put it on the screen. I'm not sharing my screen, so let me do that. Hi. So basically what we're doing today is installing stuff. It always takes like a minute to set everything up. And by a minute, I mean like several minutes. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, just make sure um, that you have the ability to use Google Colab. Uh, you'll need a Google account for that. And then there's this link here where it says use Uba Booga with Google Colab. This is a way to, if you don't have the local hardware to run language models, um, this is what you're going to want to use. And basically this is a, uh, a web UI. You'll, you'll stand it up for the purposes of like running your scripts and playing with them. Um, but it's generally like the open source way to run a language model. There's a bunch of stuff in here. You're going to want to click API if you're going to use this thing. Um, and so basically what you want to do in order to run Google Colab is you just click connect and it will connect and that's like a thing. And so now we've got um, Google Compute Engine and if you're not familiar with this kind of back-end concept uh, using all this stuff, this is how we're going to run large language models, run open source ones. If you want to run Llama, if you want to run wizard coder or mistral uh, these things are basically how that works so is it better if you have the hardware to do it locally um you know that's a great question no yes kind of like there's situations in which you're going to want something remote um anyway because if you're going to develop something that like is in production you'll want to be able to launch it somewhere um, but being able to run it locally just saves you a lot of compute, having to rent a, an expensive computer somewhere else. Like with this thing, uh, we're renting an expensive computer, um, you know, uh, somewhere, right? So what you'll want to do just as, you know, is you'll want to click play on this. It'll keep, what this will do is keep your, your session active. And then you want to click play on that. And a bunch of stuff will happen and it just like a bunch of stuff down here will go on and on so yeah there's I mean there's certain applications that you would want um, you would definitely want to have a thing up locally or, um, not locally but remotely do being able to do it locally just means you don't have to pay someone somewhere how do you know if you do the right hardware um, so generally what you're going to want to do on a Mac, you can go into system settings, um, or sorry about this Mac and you can actually look here. If you have an M something chip, you have the hardware. You'll need probably at least 16 gigs of memory. Um, 32 is better. 64 is better. So uh, but yeah, if you have an M chip, then yes. If you don't have an M chip, probably no. And then uh, for Windows, what you'll want to do, this is a virtual machine, so I don't actually know if it's going to know, like, computer management system information, maybe? Uh, yeah, uh, so in here you can find a lot of in info. 
um, I have allocated 8 gigs of, of RAM to this Windows machine, so it thinks that I have 8 gigs of RAM. Um, and so this is where you can find that information. If you go into this and you type system information, it'll tell you that. Um, but yeah, so that's the Windows. What's the, what's the right processor? Uh, in terms of processor, it really, if you've got, if you've got a recent i5 and a graphics card, then you'll be okay. But you need to have a graphics card with 16 gigs of video RAM. If you've got a Mac and it's an M something, it's integrated. And so it doesn't matter. Um, and then if you have a Linux box, I'm going to assume that you understand how to handle your own specifications. So. <clears throat> but yeah, um, if you, if you have a gaming laptop or if you have like a gaming PC, it might be okay if it's fairly new, um, but you're going to need a beefy graphics card. Gaming material, like gaming hardware is not, uh, the same as machine learning hardware. It can be repurposed to run machine learning models, but unless you have at least 16 gigs of RAM, I wouldn't even try. If you have at least 16 gigs of video RAM on Windows, you can try to run it locally. Uh, in which case, the thing that I would recommend running locally is, oh wait, uh, local LM. Oh, I didn't link to local LM. <laughs> um, Local, local LM, uh, LM Studio, sorry. Okay, it's this. So I'll go ahead and paste this in the chat. There's two, two of my face. And I'm also going to put it in Obsidian. Safety-wise, is it wise to run it locally or unsafe? Um, it depends on what you're doing in terms of safety uh, and what you mean in terms of safety, right? Um, so there's safety, like, there's safety in terms of the AI safety, um, and then there's safety in terms of, like, cybersecurity against other people safety. Um, if the AI is running locally, like, and you're going to have it write code locally, that will give it the ability to modify itself. None of the local models are hyper intelligent, so they're not, they're not really busting out of the box. Should you give Claude control to play, to like give these things and do its bidding? Maybe not, you know, so... I would say that's that's where we at as of today, Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. <laughs> Wednesday could be a whole different situation. Um, Y'all have seen it evolve rather rapidly. So yeah, LM Studio is pretty cool. Uh, opened it up over here. It's got a Mac, a Windows, and a Linux version. I don't know how it's doing. If you have gotten Booba Booba to work or you're on some other workflow, don't worry about it. Don't worry about changing your workflow to this. Really what we want is an API, right? We want to hook up Python to a large language model. That's what we're doing, right? Um, and so these are ways to do that. So we've got using Python locally, to run your code. We're going to run Python code and it's going to send a request over to a large language model. And that's largely, we're going to do a bunch of that in this class. So that's what you're going to want. You're also going to want to make sure you have an OpenAI Pro account. Um, and then also that you can get into the back end, uh, into the API. So, good uh, 
test is can I get to this page playground slash chat platform playground chat try to quit steam now y'all know I've been playing power world <laughs> um, yeah. if anyone has trouble with any of this install let me know As y'all are installing things, focus on that. I'm just going to talk. I'm not showing anything. Um, one of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to build a benchmark for ourselves. Um, pr the difference between just using a large language model for like a one-off random task and using a or and doing prompt engineering, which is developing a prompt. To, or a series of prompts or a series of agents that can do a complicated multi-step process over and over again reliably or at least reliably to some degree. So the, the thing about large language models is we are, we're dealing with stochastic results. We're dealing with randomness, non-determinism, um, and so very similar to user text uh, it's going to come back and be not what you wanted some of the time, right? And so knowing whether or not you've made the right prompt is a measure, is, it's a function of running many tests, right? Just because you typed something in with one prompt and then you ran it and the model was not able to do what you wanted doesn't mean that that prompt wasn't great. It might have just been the one out of 10 times that it failed, right? And so if you really want to know, is a prompt functioning, you really do have to get a statistical sample for that prompt, right? you got to run it 30 times. But doing that, copy and paste, run, and then start a new thing, copy and paste, run. Okay, now start a new thing. We can't be doing that and then testing again with a slight tweak. We can't be doing that. That will take way too much time. We need to script it. So um, for prompt engineering, there's like typing in your prompts and changing them and like in a sense saving your prompt somewhere, but like only kinda and like trying to remember to do it, but then never sort of doing it. Like that's not prompt engineering. That's fucking around with language models. And that's fine. That's the beginning of prompt engineering. How do we begin science? Start fucking around. How do we make it into science? We write it down. And so um, that's what we're going to do a lot of in this. And so the very first day that we write stuff, we're going to actually, uh, we're going to actually send, uh, or sorry, we're going to create a benchmark for ourselves, right? So. Generally, you want to be able to do these things in Python. Now, when I say you want to be able to do these things in Python, I don't mean from memory. I don't mean I'm going to test you, and if you can't recite the code, then you fail. Like, I don't care if you copy and paste every single time, because that's what I do. I copy and paste from the docs very confidently, and uh, it's fine. And that's how everyone codes, and especially people who've been coding for a minute. So. These are your tools. You want to be able to read and write files in Python, right? Open example.txt for reading. We'll file.read and we'll file.close. That's, there we go. Open it for writing, file.close, cool. Open it for appending. Those are the three things we can do for reading and writing files. Um, to read a directory, you want to use this little recipe here. We can kind of read through it. Um, don't worry about following right now. Just focus on install. You'll have this video later. So like don't switch focus. Just keep installing things. Um, but yeah, this is how we do it. We have import OS. We, we have some directory path and we say for file in OS dot list directory operating system dot list directory. If it ends with .md, we can use .md files. If you don't, you can use .txt files. It doesn't matter. It's just easier to like see stuff as an md file. And we have file path, os.path.join. 
and then we open it up and we read the contents of the file name. So this is what it this is what it looks like to do that. And so, you know, if you wanted to have a benchmark, you will need to be able to read a directory of files in Python. Um, there's a little bit of stuff in here about re how to read CSV files. So, you know, this is how that works. Um, and then how to extract text from a PDF. This is pretty common that you will need to read a PDF. This is a library that you can use. You'll have to install it with this, but this is how you can get stuff from a PDF. So these are sort of your tools. Don't worry about becoming a master of these tools. We're going to just use them. We're going to run into a situation where we use them and then we use them, right? So these are, these are sort of our tool belts. And then the other thing that's in our tool belt is the OpenAI Playground. One of the nice things about the playground is that I can click view code up here and it'll just give me functioning code, right? So if I just, if I want to, uh, if, if you see this when you start out and it's like something about curl, this is just how to do it without Python, just in your terminal. But we don't want to use that, we want to use Python. So we click up here to Python, we've got a bunch of text in here, and we'll copy that, and we will copy and paste a lot of code. Um, I'll go ahead and restart the session, and then do it again. Yeah. No. Um, once you do the LM Studio, what do you have to do next? Let's see. So once you have LM Studio, uh, and this will take a second. Hold on, let me pull it up. Uh, uh, there we go. So LM Studio will come up, um, and you'll it'll say like select a model to load. No models, and so you'll have to go. Let's see from home. Uh, you can click any of these like. If you click search, um, here's what you'll get. Uh, oh, uh, let's see. If you type llama, right? There's all these llama models. Um, and then the internet, there we go. So you'll get a whole bunch of different like things over here. Like what do we choose? What are all these extensions? We don't know, a bunch of stuff, right? So yeah, let's talk a little bit about how to use LM Studio, uh, and then I'll show you how to set up the Python between it. So you'll click around in here. You can kind of see like 349 people clicked heart on this, so it's probably probably a good model. Um, so you can look over here at like the bloke. This guy uploads everything, um, and so is the most common uploader of of things, uh, and then. It'll, what you'll see is it's got some stuff like license, llama2, tags, this is fa Facebook's thing. Um, you can find some other details in here, it doesn't super matter. Um, but the large, the big thing that you're looking for is this information down here. It says 12 available files. And then it's llamas 27 b chat, q2k, gigaf. 27b chat q3ks right and then it will say stuff like full gpu offload possible right and so uh what this tells you is it's gonna fit and run in your computer's uh gpu's memory right just because this says 2.83 gigabytes doesn't mean that that's how many gigabytes in memory it takes up that's the file size right and so you can kind of tell by the file sizes, like how much data is like included and not lost. And now um, there's a bunch of other information in here that will help to kind of explain what we're seeing and which one do we actually click download on, right? So you can see this is a 7B model, right? There's Q8, Q6, Q5, Q... 5, Q4KM, Q4KS, right? 
and then uh, let's see, there's Q2K, right? So these Qs are the quantization, uh, the number of bits that the model's been sort of compressed down into, essentially. It's like compression, but it's not really. It's called quantization, and it's very different than compression somehow. I am not sure how quantization works. It came out in January. A lot of people use it now, so I am using it now, and that's like... I mean, you know, uh, we'll probably have a little bit more in-depth, like dig through of some things, but it's not actually super important like that you question. deeply understand all the things. What? So. Is, is this quantization have to do with the store, like how big the float is for the weights or yes. stuff? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, that's what I thought it was, but... Yeah. So if you, if, if you do understand bit math, it's something to do with like the size of the floats. Also, they can do a thing that allows you to sort of parallel process if you've got a larger number space uh, and you've got a bunch of numbers you can like fit them in and make them make them do things we've now lost where i have memorized what's going on um and probably most of the people who are using these are like uh, so you don't have to understand it but if you follow that that's kind of where you know uh, the fidelity, it says fidelity is like what you're, what you're sacrificing here. I have not noticed a large loss in capability. The drop off is pretty small. So you can usually go down to like two or four, um, and you'll be fine. I don't understand why three is a thing. Uh, this is where, this is why I'm like, I don't feel like I'm prepared to lecture on how quantization works right at this moment, but it's like, it's this, the level, the number of bits that we've pushed it down to. So smaller number, smaller number of bits, smaller file size, but also smaller capabilities, not that much smaller. Um, if you're going to run things locally. For things like extracting text from a big blob of text, Q2 models on 7B chat are going to be great. You want to get the details out of, a, you know, get two pieces of information out of this paragraph, this is going to be great for that. But, um, you know, so that's, that's 7B. If I kind of click here to 13B, you can see I can still offload this on my 64 gigabyte GPU. Um, and then if I go up here to 70B, it still says that it will fit in my GPU's memory. So I can run Llama 70B if it's quantized down to Q2. Um, generally, the number, like 70B, the B is how many gigs it takes in your memory-ish. Like, rule of thumb, pretty decent, like, mental uh, conversion, right? Uh, it used to be. And now that we have quantization done, it's like, you can kind of see this is 29.2 and I think it only takes like 35 gigs. So it's pretty decent for getting a, for example, a 16 gigabyte video card to maybe run this 13B model or like even possibly this 70B or like a 34B, you know. So that stuff was not possible before, now it is. Welcome to the future. Why would you pick that one as opposed to the one on top with the most um, hearts? With the most hearts? So um, a lot more people have uh, downloaded this one because more people have hardware that a 7B model can fit onto than own hardware that a 70B model can fit onto. Most people do not own hardware that can run this at all. Um, like, I don't, you know, y'all can check, but like when you download LM Studio, if it says that for you, like it knows, it says estimated total RAM 64 gigs, right? Um, and so it'll guess how much space you have and then it will tell you whether or not it will probably um, uh, work. 
It says there may be other factors that pre prevent it from loading, such as the model's architecture, model file integrity, amount of memory available, right? Like I'm using a lot of stuff. I've got Windows running down here, eating up, you know, several eight gigs of RAM, plus probably another two for overhead. So like, it's very, um, let me just think, uh, it's, it's gonna guess, but if it doesn't work, it's probably that you either have something running or if it's, it's just too much. Um, I would also recommend, like, this is a file size. This is not the amount of memory it will take up. So if you're going to download a 30 gig file, like, don't let, don't download 15 30 gig files. You will eat your whole hard drive very quickly. So I would recommend for most people, you want to have maybe 7 or 13 B and you want to just download, I would download the lowest quantized one because you, you really just want to be able to test prompts uh, locally. If you want like the world's smartest model, just pay for chat GPT. It's going to be cheaper than paying for hosting. So that's what I would recommend. But if we can do the 70 B, like if it says that you have the space, like the physical space yeah. and the GPU offload, you would say to get like as high of a file size as possible so i would get both like i would download multiple um you want to be able to write prompts that can be used by the smallest dumbest cheapest model possible right so if you have for example you know like when we did that um going in the national archives finding a random oral history transcript, copying and pasting it into ChatGPT and saying, did this exper person experience overwork or not? You know, like, yes or no. Um, 7B is going to be able to do that. Yes, no. Like, classify things really well. Um, 70B is going to maybe be able to, like, explain what factors led to the overwork, right? Whereas 7B might struggle to really do anything but maybe maybe identify some quotes, right? And so those are kind of the, the two things that I would recommend. Um, the other thing I was going to say is there's a big difference between 7B chat and 7B. And you'll notice this in the heart, heart numbers, right? 7B chat has been trained with a prompt template to with this text you're a helpful respectful and honest assistant always answer as helpfully as possible while being safe like it's been trained with this right and so it's gone through what's known as reinforcement learning with human feedback right rlhf so people have when given a prompt like thumbs up or thumbs down some chat content. And this gives it the ability to respond like a chat bot. This model is different. It's what's known as an instruct model. Instruct models really are just token predictors. So it's really more of the like Google Docs autocomplete than it is a chatting entity right it's not it's not used to a back and forth with a user it doesn't think of a chat transcript as what it's doing by default those models are they're usually not aligned right they're the ones that just read the internet and so they read every seo article and so they're the ones that respond pretty well with like Below is an article of the 10 coolest snakes. And then it's like 10 coolest snakes, you know, and it types it all out. Um, but the chat model is like something where you'd say, can you please write me a article on the 10 coolest snakes? And then chat GPT says, certainly here's an article on the 10 coolest snakes, 10 coolest snakes. And then it writes the article, right? Those are two very different like responses because one is, it's been trained to respond in the form of a chat. Um, 
Instruct models have weirder holes of content in them that we don't know about. There's a lot of stuff hiding in Instruct models that we don't understand. Um, because it's been trained with just a bunch of, like, it's been trained to autocomplete text, and so that's really all it does. Um, but there's more stuff that autocompletes on the internet. Like, you can get it to write, like, a 4chan bot very easily just by being, like, anonymous colon and then letting it autocomplete. So that's the difference. So when you see chat versus non-chat, that's what we're talking about. And you usually want a chat model because usually you're going to frame your, your request as natural language. It's very rare you would actually want a non-chat model, but for function calling it might be helpful. What? Sorry. Inflation. Inflation. Translation, like, oh, translation, and uh, probably still chat, honestly. Mm. I think chat's been trained on translation. So that's the beginning of this. Um, and that's kind of the difference between a lot of these models. Um, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good. I fixed the audio. <laughs> Are you going to uh, uh, walk the booga? I guess that, that's finally. Yeah, I can do that. Installed. Yeah, definitely. So this is Uva Booga, it's installed. And so um, all you really need to do is just hit connect up here. You'll hit the this play button, then you'll hit this play button. Oh, yeah, I, I, I was tracking that when you okay. said it earlier, I'm sorry. And then it ran all this and at the end it offered a link to yeah. it locally. And, yes. Uh, right, so. so these two URLs are your live deployment of uh, uh, Uva right now we're running this model, the bloke Mythomax 13B GPTQ. So, um, here, if you go in here to, is it this radio? I think it's this one. This is the back end. So this comedy double Moscow opposed up here, this one, that's not gradio dot live. Uh, let's see. Is it? Oh, sorry, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, actually, let me go to the Gradio.live back end. Yeah, okay, never mind. You want to click the Gradio.live. This is a large language model now that's open source that's running in this chat. Um, tell me, uh, or like, you know, please write an article about the 10 coolest snakes. Um, I wonder how it will, you know. So, okay. Snakes are fascinating. It's just going to write me a you know, little book report there on snakes. And then there's this here is your API. And so if I did slash open API dot JSON, what I'll get is uh, the swagger spec. This is sort of the back end for your um, for your uh, model. And so if you can use a swagger spec, this will do it, but don't don't worry about that right this second. Um, so you're in here and it's like, yay, snakes. okay, so you you know it's it's doing stuff. Um, so what you have here, is very similar to what you have here. Here in this LM Studio, once you've downloaded a thing, 7B chat, something, um, and you go over here to AI chat, so this and this are the same thing. They're the same effect. It's test out the model that we have loaded, right? So uh, if I want to test out a model on LM Studio, I click one of the models, uh, and so I'll do, you know, Llama 2 chat, 7, 7 gigs. So it, you know, it takes a second to load this model. This one came with a model preloaded, right? And I asked it about the 10 coolest snakes. Um, there's a bunch of details here, stuff you can set up, like start reply with, sure thing, or like, 
you know, you can have it always have a beginning reply so that you can like, you know, programmatically change things. There's also this over here um, where it says mode. And this says it defines how the chat prompt is generated. So in instruct and chat instruct modes, the instruction template, that's what they're talking about, right? Um, chat, chat instruct or instruct. So if you look at chat, that's like, please write an article. Um, if I go down to instruct, uh, basically, let's see, what, what happened? Hold on, chat instruct, scroll up, then instruct. And I just type in here, no. Uh, top 10 coolest snakes. Okay, so in this, um, if I were to let me make a new chat and I'd say, please generate a listicle on the top 10 coolest snakes, it might not really, okay, it did, it, it did a, and it's, it's a chat model though, so it's kind of been trained on chat, so what this really does is it is it changes like a, I don't know, let me look, uh, see if there's like. What is the term listicle? It's oh, like, here. you know, those, uh, like those Buzzfeed lists, like five oh, okay. funnest summertime. Okay, okay listicle. Yeah. <laughs> Never heard that. Yeah. So um, let's kind of look through here uh, at some of the stuff that you can do in here. So there's here is where you can actually change the model, right? And if I want to, if I want to use a model from example, uh, for example, hugging face, and I just want to find like a large language model, um, octopus V2. All right. Is there a model card? Can I use this? Are you going to let me? All right. Maybe let's see. No nope. archive, save tensors models files maybe no nope. no model anyway it's fine here we'll just click models um, and then over here I can go to text generation that's what we actually want a model to do hold on text generation So the big disclaimer to all of this is that uh, allegedly ChatGPT is still better than any of these, right? That's the disclaimer. Yeah, I mean, Claude is still pretty decent. There are some pretty decent, like, um, there are some very decent things like DBRX Instruct is pretty good. Um, but yeah, I mean, XAI's Grok is dumb, um, but like Llama's, Llama's pretty decent, um, and Llama gets better faster than I think a lot of the other models, and uh, Mixtral also is pretty decent, but I don't think it works on Uba Booga. So, yeah. Um, Interesting. Um so uh, when you say ChatGPT Pro version, I, I have ChatGPT Plus. Is that is it Pro above that or something different? Oh yeah, that's or the same. That... Sorry, Pro is plus. the same thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. Same thing. is the plus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. So sometimes you don't have to share, but here's here's Gamma Seven B, right? So I can copy this, Google Gamma Seven B. Um. And so if I go over here to the text generation and I click in here and I paste it um, and I click download, it will start downloading it unless it complains. Uh, oh, unauthorized. Yeah, it does say that I have to share. Um, but like the bloke. All right, so there's this guy, the bloke who doesn't require you to give things and just like re-uploads things. So uh, we'll just use this person's thing. No, hold on. Here, all right. I'll do this. Download, and so then it will start downloading the files, right? 
So um, these are things that you can do. Uh, there's a bunch of, there's 40 million trillion parameters and things that you can tune in here. The main ones that you're gonna be used to are the number of tokens that it'll allow itself to respond with. This is the context window, uh, the output context limit. The temperature, which we've seen just how random. The top P, um, there's also a number of other ones. Frequency, repetition, presence, repetition, penalty range, typical P, top K. Play with these, basically, is what I'm gonna say. Um, read these. They're, they're all explained pretty well uh, and documented pretty well. There's a lot of things in here that like it's not going to be super clear what these things do. It's okay. We're not really going to play with these a whole lot. Um, you don't really need to because most of the most of the presets are pretty decent. If you're trying to do something really unique, this is, we might play around in here or somewhat in here in the smoothing curve or something like that. Uh, but it really depends on what you're doing and it's like all of all of the dopamine in your brain will leak out if I just read all these to you. So <laughs> um, I think the big thing was the instruction template. So I was just talking about how most chat things are models um, that have been built. There's this thing called alpaca and um, essentially this is what ends up as the instruction template. Um, and so if you're gonna create a LoRa, which this tool will allow you to do, if you wanna make a LoRa, you can train one. There's a tutorial here you can just click on. So if you wanna train a LoRa, you can do it. Um, and so which instruction template you use is really important because if you use an instruction template and the model's been trained mostly with this one way of looking at text and then you use another one, it's, it's like not going to overlap enough to impact the model, if that makes sense, um, without going into the, you know, all of the details around it. It just doesn't overlap the way the rest of the model's been uh, doing things. So that's the instruction template. Um, you can also, within Uva Booga, do um, personas. So if you want to create a custom GPT where you kind of have a custom context, um, there's like example, it's the, uh, Chiara is a young computer engineer nerd with an act for problem solving. And so she's got like, a greeting, hey, I'm so excited to meet you, you know, and like, there's some examples here of like how to talk as this character, right? So if you wanted to build your own custom GPT, this backend supports it. Uh, LM Studio has that function as well. Um, essentially, it's in here somewhere. There's like system prompt here where you can kind of change the system prompt. Uh, and I think you can create a new config preset. Yeah, no, I don't know. Hold on. Uh, there's a way to do it. Mm, view chat? No. Plain text markdown, no space. Oh, like, yeah. Okay, so there's like a bunch of stuff over here. And then... Yeah, there's a bunch of details and stuff you can change. Here's the model. Mm. And then there's like notes about the conversation, but uh, there's like a way to do it and I can't remember how to do it. Might be under the models themselves. But anyway, um, there's also, like you can see, my models are here and uh, I know, no, we don't want playground. Um, one of the things that we will do is this multi-model -mo session, which will allow you to run multiple models at once. So you can test a prompt on multiple models um, at one time. So you can see which model actually gives you the best results. So that's how we get to the research part of, of uh, all this stuff. 
And there is... With the best results, can you say that it came in again? Oh, yeah. So there's a, mul a mul multi-model session. Not multimodal, but multi-model. Um, where you can use multiple different models, like, you know, Llama and Gemma, or Gemma and Mixtral. You could load all three and test which one is the best, right? You can also compare qu different quantizations. So if you're like, which quantization method should I use for this task? You could download all the different ones or like a few of the different ones and directly compare them right here um, using the same prompt. So generally that's, that's what this thing is for. And then this chat is uh, just like the other chat. I am pretty sure there's like a... thing in here um obsidian vision i don't know yeah anyway there's a bunch of different like sort of things but meta ai llama 2 chat is is the preset for this and then i think it's the system prompt that is where like the character settings live so um yeah 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 inference parameter parameters prompt format yeah, here's the prompt format. This is the the same thing as the instruction template. Um, I am sure that there is like a character thing in here, but I don't I don't remember where it is right now. Uh, maybe it's no no whatever it's fine. Um, but yeah, like what side? What are you looking for? Between? There's like a character thing where you can kind of have like the personas or the custom GPT in the oh, same yeah. way that you can here. Right. Um, so yeah. You can also upload a character file here if you want. Um, so that's how. This is character or the character.ai format is how the open source world is doing personas aka custom GPTs. Um, this this back end does not use functions, right? You can't have it use tools. Uh, you have to use a, a thing called Langchain for that, but we'll go over doing that later in the uh, course. So yeah, these are this is sort of the back end. Um, this is the session. Uh, you know, don't worry too much about generation chat like these things you probably will not change most of these things you might create a character you might train a Laura um, mostly you will put information in a prompt and write a bunch of code to create a bunch of agents that talk to each other and use the single responsibility principle to design a a, 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 a swarm of agents so yeah All right, um, so making sure that we have OpenAI and all this stuff set up. Um, there's uh, an, one more thing that you wanna do, which is when you click view code, you wanna just create an API key. I will readily create, you know, a key, I call it live code, if somebody, like if I'm creating it in front of people and I'm recording. So I just, uh, like, you know, copy it and then I delete it later. So, um, a lot of times you're going to want to do that, but, uh, yeah. And so if you have, um, Google Colab and you want to use, um, And in a secret, right? What I'm going to do is click like add new secret, uh, open AI API key, and then I'm just going to paste it in here. Uh, and then I'm going to give my notebook access to that. So that's how I add, add that key. And I want to call it open AI API key. It is important that you use this exact variable name because it does usually count on that somehow. 
So there's that way to do it. If you're going to do it locally, of course, you don't need to do that. You can just use a, um, you can just use a environment variable. Uh, so I'll just open a new folder, go into source, and then I'll make a new folder, live code, uh, agents, and then I'll open that up and create a terminal and you know, if this is your if this is your workflow you just want to export uh, open AI API key equals that and that'll set that environment variable for you. A lot of times I use a .env file to manage my secrets, open AI, so I don't have to go get a new one every time and delete that old one. An AI key, or sorry, API key equals that. That way I have it. So these are the ways we can store that stuff. And then if you want to test to make sure that you're able to use that key, what I would do is copy this again this is recorded so you don't have to don't have to try to keep up I'm just gonna call this test.py I'm gonna paste it in there make this a little bigger right now I don't have to know a lot uh, of, of code if I use something like OpenAI API um, but if you're ever just not sure what something does just print it print the response and you're you're good to go I don't have to know a lot of uh, Python but I do need to do, if I'm gonna do local Python I do need to be able to create a uh, virtual environment so you can do Python 3-m bnb that'll create you a little local install of Python here and then I can activate it by saying source uh, env bin activate. If you're very new to code, I do recommend stick with uh, GitHub Colab. It's going to be easier than uh, installing stuff locally yourself. If you're learning Python really soon, maybe install it locally. Um, I had done this with the Jupyter recently. Is Google Jupiter Colab is great. even better than Jupyter? Totally yeah. fine to use Jupyter. Um, might struggle if you don't have the hardware to run the stuff, but also totally fine to, you know, yeah. Okay. So whatever environment you're happy with in Python, I just want to, I'm mostly trying to get it on the video so that anybody who watches this later gets uh, access. So then you want to do API key in here, and then you're going to want to do OS, or sorry, import OS. And then you'll do uh, open AI API key equals OS dot get environment open AI key. That way I don't, I don't have to save my secret password for OpenAI in in my code here so I can like put this code on the internet so this is really all we need I should say this we added this import OS statement got this variable that's that variable I said here this went into there and then it goes in here into the client and then we just get a response Hey, this is a test is all I said right so I'll just run this I'll say pip install open AI because I also have to do that um, and then I will say Python test .py and see if it just works yay it worked how do we know it worked let me set control K and then I'll hit up again and you can kind of see what we got Bunch of gobbledygook. In the chat, please. Oh, sorry. Say, say that one more time. Can you pass paste that code in the chat? Of course, yeah. And then, yeah.
yeah, I will publish the recording uh, on this on the on the page for um, for the. I will publish it right here. Uh, yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, where were we? We were here. Okay. So you can kind of see that we got a bunch of details down here. And if I just like make this really, really big, we can kind of see oh, a lot of gobbledygook. Sometimes it's a little easier if I take this, especially if I don't read, you know, um, and just sort of paste it in here so that I can like sort of parse it out. And so I can see, okay, let's read character by character. What do we have here? got a chat completion. If we look over here, it says client.chat.completions.create. So we got a chat completion as a result. All right, that makes sense. So I'll just hit enter here. Okay, and then it says ID chat compl. All right, so this is some sort of way of identifying the specific chat completion. All right, so I'll hit enter there. And then I've got choices, okay choices equals square brace. Okay, so more than one choice in this list of choices. That's what a square brace means to me. Okay, cool. So then within there, there's like a choice, the finish reason, and you see how I'm just sort of pressing enter at the beginning of each one of these things and just sort of mentally for myself. Okay. Finish reason, stop index zero log probs, none. All right, cool. Message, chat completion, message. All right. Chat completion, chat completion, message. A lot of times you want to do stuff like this. Um, especially with these things, because it's a lot easier to kind of mentally clock what's going on. Right? Like there's like, all these things that are inside of other things. And this can be where code turns into like hieroglyphics, right? If you're not used to writing a lot of code or if you just don't write a lot of code all the time, it turns into hieroglyphics when we do this. So the way that we unhieroglyphic the code, uh, we demystify it by just sort of making little, just hit enter after everything. So you can kind of see it all. Yeah, it's to be called pretty printing and some some environments do that automatically for you, yeah right? so. yeah 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 and some sometimes some environment will do it automatically for you when you're very new to code you want to get to the point where you can kind of do it with your eyes right you want to be able to like read through these things what i'm doing is i'm just i'm finding all these commas and i'm going to the beginning of the next thing and just hitting enter Right. And it's kind of giving me an idea of what's in this thing. You will want to do this, especially if you're new to writing code. Um, you know, and this sort of gives us like, okay, okay. So I got a bunch of details in here. Check completion. Okay. So I get back a completion which has choices, right? Um, and then it's got choices and it. Each, each thing inside of choices is a choice. Okay, cool. And then there's a bunch of details here, none of which I care about, but I do care about this string. If I want to get this string out, how might I do that? Well, so I know that what I printed out here was response, and that's what this is, this whole thing. You're gonna have to do this a lot when you're using these APIs, is sort of like pull things apart and try to dig down into them. So I know I, I don't care about when it was created. That's not what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get the text. I don't care about what model. I know that. I'm just trying to get the text. I don't care about how much tokens I used or how big the prompt was or how many to I don't care. I don't care. I only want this text. So I know it's in choices. I know it's not under any of these other things. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to type dot choices. Um, and if I don't have code autocomplete on, then I can kind of see, oh, I've gotten into 
you know, this is different. I was getting this whole big thing. Now I'm getting a smaller amount, a, just a choice or just all of the choices. So if I want, okay, well, this is a list. It's got these square braces. So I need to do zero choices at zero. So, I mean, I do it like this, you know, all right, I've sort of narrowed it down. Okay. And now I've got finish reason, index, log probs, message. Okay, so dot message. Oop, look at that. I run it again, sort of carve that down, right? Chat completion message, okay, content, role, function call, right? All right, content, that's what I care about. Dot content, okay, cool. And is, is this uh, VS Code, by the way? It is. Okay. So by doing this, um, you know, I've kind of carved down and kind of gotten into this code, goes to ChatGPT, gives it the words, hey, this is a test, and then uh, it returns what ChatGPT would say to that. Um, hey write me a poem about snakes is a new thing and then I can hit that and it'll there's a poem about snakes yay right and I can kind of look at this code and I can see okay well this is the thing that goes off to chat GPT very much like this thing it's like a bunch of little pieces inside of one action right so this is the line of code that goes off to ChatGPT, sends your text, and comes back. And so if you want, just like, for example, please write me, at, write an email apologizing about having to push class by two weeks to all my students, right? Like, this is really what we actually are probably trying to do is write a script that writes an email. Boom. Now I have the email, right? So a lot of times this is more like what we're actually trying to do is like go to chat GPT, get a whole email. Um, and then like maybe use that email in another script that actually sends an email, you know, that actually goes to SendGrid or like, another email provider, Twilio, somewhere, uh, and does something with that email. So this is sort of a manual function call almost, right? Like all we've done is generate the text. We haven't told ChatGPT to do anything with this email, but we did ask it to write the email. And now that email is in a variable. I could, instead, instead of printing that, I could say uh, email, right? And so now I have a variable called email and it won't print, it doesn't even do anything. But I could say print email. And so what we want to be able to do is click, you know, write send email. Um, but this is where we start is just by getting stuff. So, you know. Um, this is the general stuff that we're going to do in this class. If y'all have questions on any of these tools, now's the time. Is, is it reasonable to say, gee, I don't want to really learn these uh, cryptic API specs and do that discovery. I want that GPT to actually do it. Can I give it a spec yes. and say, I want to help me create calls for doing this and just have it at least structure something that is yeah. right, almost Right, and then, then go ahead and use it in the lab and see if, if I can use it to, to get a you know, response. Yeah, so what I tend to do is I start with the most basic of basic things like this, um, like uh, copy pasta, make sure it works great. All right, and then um, copy pasta is what I call copying and pasting. Um, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> So if I say like, can you write me using this example, a version of this that will 
send an email through send grid. Right? Um, and then you just do that, and then it will do this. Um, and then it's like install send grid, and then it just writes the thing. So this is why I said if you need to like if you're learning Python or if you haven't written code in a while or if you're learning to code for the very first time now, um, like you do not need to be able to write the function that sends the email. You need to be able to describe the function that sends the email, but you don't need to be able to write it. I said send grid. You could have just said S actually sends the email and it would have made something up, right? And so if it's, you know, if it's feeling like, oh, but then I have to learn SendGrid, you don't. You no more had to learn SendGrid than you had to learn SendGrid to write this thing. Like, you just got to say, use it, and then it does it. But as long as you can read this, right, you know, okay, I recognize this. I, I feel like I can. I mean, I, I'm, of all the people in this class, I mean, I'm the person who was a C++ programmer like 30 years ago. Right. But, and I've been become more of a hands-off architect, solution systems analyst, right? Mm -hmm. Requi both requi writing requirements as well as, you know, designing sort of user, user experiences and, and uh, you know, database work. But like, I haven't actually been uh, coding a long time, but I feel like when ChatGPT writes an example for me that I can, I can pretty much parse it you know, mm -hmm. to, to where I can start using it in a lab and, and you know, getting results and, and tweaking it. Exactly. I have written Go quite a few times, um, and so uh, recently with Python and I'm like, or sorry, with ChatGPT, and I do not know Go, and I've never bothered to learn it because I was like, we're gonna stop at Python, thanks, bye. <laughs> you know, I didn't wanna. Um, so yeah, it's it's valid to just be able to read these things. You're not gonna be able to note if ChatGPT has left something out. Um, a lot of times, uh, if you just say, how could we make this script more extensible, um, it will do these things like a little bit better. So, and then it does that and it's like, here's logging and here's functions and here's, I'll fix it. I'll make it nicer. So like, how do you make it even nicer? How do we make it even nicer? Those are crazy. The, uh, the the memes where they just keep telling it to, until until it breaks. Happier, make it happier. Yeah, the happier. happier. Bunny. <laughs> so I mean, you could just say like, "How could we make this script nicer?" And it's like, "Oh," or like, "Are there any? Is anything missing in this script?" And it's like, "Great." So um, I do recommend, um, you know, give it its cookie, um, and then like. I do recommend use ChatGPT to write any of this stuff. Uh, and if y'all are new to code, I don't know if you've seen me do this, but like all day today I was, I was writing a bash script and it could just write a bash script. And I was like, something's wrong. And so I just kept copying and pasting the error message without any context. I was just like, this is the error. And it's like, here's what you do. And I'm like, this is the error. And it's like, here's what you do. So copy and paste any error messages that you get directly into the same conversation that wrote the code and it will debug it for you. Um, so don't worry about needing to know Python before you start. In fact, you're never gonna sit down and like learn Python because you should and you should just know it better before you like no, you need to use Python to do something before you'll be able to pick it up. Uh, it's a little bit like learning to speak a foreign language. Like you could just read books and drill for a long, long time and still not be able to speak it very well. Uh, but if you go to the country and you're like, you need to find the bathroom, you're going to, you're going to memorize the word bathroom really quick. Right? So, 
the same thing with Python. Until you need to use it, it's not going to be a thing that feels approachable. But then if you're just like, how do I get this to happen in Python? You quickly realize the way to do that is to Google, how do I get this to happen in Python? Or to chat GPT it, you know. Oh, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, depending on the model, are there some models that are better for remembering the context of what you're doing because I think I've experienced after a while like if you get far enough in the conversation mm -hmm. it stops it starts to forget like the original code that it wrote itself mm -hmm. uh, so you have to like kind of repaste like the current code yeah so generally there's a couple of ways to manage that one repeatedly tell uh chat gpt to summarize what you've built uh, so just say, you know, great, can you summarize the conversation so far, you know, and then it, um, this is called roll up or conversation summary as like a strategy. Uh, and so like after you get to a certain context length and you can measure the context length with Python, we'll talk about how to do that in another day, but, um, you would want to just add a certain size, say, summarize the conversation so far. Okay, what's the latest full full version of the code? And then start a new context or ask for the latest complete version of the code, basically. And then... Idea, could you, okay. could you, uh, could you um, enable a, a custom GPT to, uh, to use GitHub? Yes. And to like basically work with you. Like, you know, let's see the code now, check it in, check yes. it out, and branch it, you know, everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's this one, and, you know, this will spiral into a thing, but yeah, this one. Um, it's okay. I like it better than Open Interpreter. Um, and when you ask it to change things, what it does is it applies a git diff. So it it only makes commits so it doesn't you don't actually see the changes you only see the commits so it's pretty nice, cool nice. Yeah. can you paste that link oh yeah yeah okay yeah. um yeah i have to i have the same thing with custom gpts wanting to uh um Wanting them to have persistent memory. So either the database is an option or GitHub <laughs> if you're developing code and Ron, persistence. Roan just okay. got one to use a data store today. So um, what was it? Nice. Which, which vector database did you use? I don't know. I use ChromoDB um, at the moment. Oh, there's okay. lots of different options, um, but yeah, I use ChromoDB. But there's ones that use also. Someone turning chat. Yeah, there's one that uses ChromoDB, and then um, I can't remember. But it was super easy to set up. It was just like it's like preloaded into an autogen library. Yeah. Um, so if you're just using like there's a few different things that use vector databases. There's one that uses retrieval augmented generation uh, to like gather materials from either online or from your local system to like use as uh, referral things for the model that you're using. So you can use it to kind of very sort of fine tune a model for your purposes. And there's also a different Chroma DB instance, which can be used to uh, create like an infinite context. So when you close your instance it and reopen it, it will just um, load the database again, and then it will be the same chat. Yeah. It's pretty cool stuff. But yeah, it's a lot of it's a lot of little details. Um, try not to get overwhelmed with the crazy number of things that comes out. Um, or that we throw at you, like, you know, that's why I wanted to do an install thing. I was like, well, we should meet and get the install done, so. Um, but yeah, it's very, it's very, very easy to drown in the fire hose. Try not to 
worry about not being able to drink the whole fire hose. You can't. You can't drink the whole fire hose. Uh, it's too big. It's too fast. Yeah. So. Um, but I don't know. Uh, vector DB should get a little easier soon. So I think we're covering that. Uh, if I remember correctly, are we covering that? I can look. Uh, let's see. We are going to. No, actually, we're not covering that. Um, okay, cool. Well, yeah. Anyway. Um, VectorDB is a P Python package? There's a, a Python package called VectorDB, and there's also a lot of other ones. Also, Postgres does a VectorDB, and ChromaDB is one that a lot of people are using. A hosted vector database is very expensive right now. Like, so expensive. I don't know why. Um, and then there are free ones, but they're like, you know, those free ones that are not really free, but they sort of, like, you can, you can use it to just test it out, but you can't use it for any real use case. Um, so... But I do recommend there's PGDB, ChromaDB, and then there is a VectorDB in Python, but I, don't, I haven't used that one. I've also used PyMilvis. I also can't recommend it. It's not that great. Um, as an aside, with VectorDB, you're dealing with search, which is like... It's not necessarily exactly just memories, right? Like, it's not a bunch of facts, you know? Um, fact extraction, in fact, is kind of a hard problem. Uh, if you think about, like, what we were talking about before with the, the, uh, the oral transcripts, right? The oral histories on the archive.org. Um, looking at those, uh, simple fact extraction, like, did this person display or indicate symptoms of overwork? Did they indicate symptoms of anxiety? What's their name? When were they born? When did they work at the National Archives? These are facts, right, that are in it. And so to extract them, like Linda Cosgrove, it's from 1944 to 1968. Like, those are facts, if that makes sense. And so to extract them and actually put them somewhere, like putting them in a vector data store is not necessarily what you want to do because the vector data store doesn't know what that fact is about, right? Like if it just has birth date, 1932, you know, um, it's not going to be able to find that again in relation to Linda, you know. And so, uh, you would want to store a document about Linda, right? And that document would have, like, her name, her birth date, when she worked there, where she worked, details about whether or not she was overworked for the overworked study, right? And then, if you wanted to ask, well, what about Linda? Was she also overworked? Then it would be like, yes, Linda displayed, displayed this, you know. So... That's kind of the strategy for a vector data store. It's for document recall, not for individual fact recall. If you want fact recall, simple facts, you probably want a SQL database. You, want, you got a bunch of facts, put them in a SQL database. That's kind of what you want to do. So, Or, or a NoSQL database. Yeah. 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 Document, documents make sense. If it can be thought of as documents, then vector makes sense. Otherwise, no. So. All right. Other questions? Everybody feel like they got set up with a local large language model or an uba booba large language model? Depending on your hardware, your horsepower. Can I ask about the tool call response in one of the... In one of the notebooks? 
No, just in in the thing you did, I noticed that the OpenAI thing had the tool call response. I've never seen it so clearly shown. Like, um, mm. just in the test.py you ran, when you got the response, it, uh, um, where was it? So you got, yeah, you know when you had it in your terminal and then you updated your thingy. Yeah, just there we thing. go. Um, So there's this thing here, it says function call none, tool calls none. So, oh, so you use the in your in your terminal, I thought I saw it but for as a response, like when you know the terminal at the bottom that you can drag up. Um I think here. Uh, how yeah, so just on that just very near the top, function call none. So was that something you sent? Was that the message you sent or was mm -hmm. that the This is the response. response. That I got back. Okay. Um, the way that it looks when it comes back, like the chat completion can't use tools. It only assistants can use tools. Um, and so we could, I could briefly cover the assistant. Well, the tool call thing is That's like. It's a big Does VS Code work like a like an API harness where you can make API calls and look at uh, the results? Yeah, they have tools in there to allow that. Um, Orbit Explorer, no. Testing. Uh, because are or were, you, were you were you doing this all with curl on the on the terminal? Oh, um, I was doing this with this test.py function. So I didn't actually write like a thing in here, but I know that there is a REST API client for VS Code. Yeah, here we go. Thunder client, um, which will uh, test a REST API. I haven't used this in a minute, but I oh, you, don't, you don't have to digress. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's basically just like Postman, so, um, yeah, yeah, that's what I would do. Um, so yeah. Generally, uh, if you're trying to get a local large language model to work, uh, that was the other thing I was going to do, it was in LM Studio, if you go here to this and you go to hmm, is it here is it under playground local server that's what it is so if you go over to the local server um you'll see a button that says local server if you're on a mac click default local studio lm studio mac os it's important and you click click this um because of it sets a lot of stuff on metal. If you're not on metal, um, probably Code Llama Instruct is fine, but default LM Studio Mac OS is the one you want. And then it's um, a server model settings, server model settings, right? Right. Um, okay. And then over here, you can click Chat Python. And so if you say base URL equals localhost one two three four v1 api key lm studio so you just you would copy this and then i can go over here and i can replace the client with that client it's the same thing everything else works the same except here with the model lm studio will show you you get completion and we do it the same way but the model is the bloke llama something, whatever. So copy this. And then you'll paste it in here. Save it. And then if we do this, um, and I hit python test.py, it will complain and say that it can't do that. Uh, oh, I have to click start server. <laughs> you have to click start server. <laughs> and then... Uh, and then you click test.py and it will totally
totally work without any problems. Totally work. Yeah, it worked without any problems. Hooray. And you can actually see here that you got a request last message please write an email apologizing about having to post class and then it writes and it gives you in the save shape it has chat.choices.message.con you know or yeah choices.message.content is how you get the details um, and so it's an OAI compatible server if you want to use an assistant sort of shows you how to use the assistance. Um, actually, uh, no, never mind. It doesn't really show you how to use the assistance API. So anyway, but this is how to use the OpenAI uh, client to produce uh, open source output, basically. So this won't hit my OpenAI key limit thing. Anyway, hopefully that's helpful. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and st hit stop on the recording unless anyone has any good questions that should definitely be in the video. It's mostly for Caitlin, I think. <laughs> Hi, Caitlin.